Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did, you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys, it's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this, that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst. You gotta get up, walk down that long, scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes if you were feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history, you're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health and so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters, so she'd put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth, and yes, yeah, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian Laundry Day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when Laundry Day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry, hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe, and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn, but the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. 
and yeah. Number five. Urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee because it's so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was just, it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years, the bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's mealtimes, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a shit. I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair, and perform other other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I have no I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously, today. Horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. 
beautiful. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course, that was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal Seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw, okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times, if it wasn't horse hair, it was thin, long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. 
back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna stick to the spearmint. S spearmint, Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one is, hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting, I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign, but a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? <laughs> well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 1600s, 
16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Kicking off the list at number 10, wiper no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go, where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Because you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, hm, hm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brick-lined pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy hit a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We've talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers were responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three-in-one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, doormat toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered and they're destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven, shards and shards. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. I think again. This is a part four, and honestly, I can do four more parts 
on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my god. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all, not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. Since no, they're gonna, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, mm, there you go. Number five. Shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four in one shampoos that wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It was just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, aqua tofana. Not to be confused with Aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tefania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tefana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig, then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a shit on a boat? Whale watching fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day, before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, I think. I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. 
Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Ray's is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Ray's is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. Mm. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesbro Ponds bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box. A warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. Number 10, spinning. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching Western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like brownie green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually, because no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti-spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thor Radia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ha ha ha, though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably, I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together. We still do it in like water parks. We swim in pools of pee pee and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, so great, you're like, why'd you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so 
boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archeology span and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The the mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. Number five, dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. And I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face, and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick, you ask? The radiation, they didn't know this yet, it was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face, now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what, at least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? 
now? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows. Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches, the early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't wanna be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. What's up? Kicking off the list at number 10, hot topics. Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. Not just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun, or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies, and one of them apparently is a star. That's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on. But today, there's a visee, luckily, for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Ebers Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today, all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. 
One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time, saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion, and then drink a beer, and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that sh put it in your mouth, and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog, mix in its gall and curd, and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the f that means. Like, imagine getting that on a prescription. You're like, a yellow frog? What? Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects, like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history, and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yeah. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, it works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the Great Stink. Yeah, the Great Stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up, leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I wanna know who the first guy was to be like, you know what, nah, I'm going home. This sucks, this sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They had to soak it in chloride to be like, that's better, it's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford, that's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head, a brilliant play might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder? When all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruin the vibes, and now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile will get rid of most of it, but you'd probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey will get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work. Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Just some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Can line, so. Number three, Red Dead Bandage. America, 1864. There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict, it wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason, idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. 
specifically the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So, after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo boo better. Number two. Ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays and let me tell you, still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church, they were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg, a little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now, I'm gonna go figure it out. Number 1. Heavy Stomach We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense, as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with it, I'm sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory, I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> Kicking off the list at number 10, dirty beds. Okay, so far on this disgusting series, I can't believe we're on part seven, but we've talked about storing chamber pots under your bed. Pretty yuck, that's if you were lucky enough to have a bed, of course. If you were rich in the 1400s, having a bedroom was the talk of the town. You would have guests over to hang out in your bedroom. That was like the place to be. Social gatherings in your bedroom, that's my worst nightmare. A couple of nights talking about noble deeds, meanwhile you're all tucked in with your ass out, hair all messy, half asleep, like, huh, who is it? Most of the time in the 14th century, your mattress wasn't even a mattress, it was just a pile of straw. It was horrible, you had to sleep in your clothes, the same tunic and cloak you've worn all day, remind you, because you'll freeze at night otherwise, right? Because you're basically outside, these barns, this old wooden, not great. Also, these beds weren't in your rooms or anything, they were just like tucked in a corner. You didn't have social gatherings around the sack of straw, you know what I mean? Your bed was more often than not riddled with bird poop as well. You weren't alone in these cold rooms, you know, birds hiding up above. Also, spiders? I don't even want to know. I don't want to dive into that. Let's move on. Number nine, mouthwash. Ancient Romans would use urine as mouthwash. I believe we've mentioned that before on this, again, disgusting series. That's always a fun fact to bring up at a house party next time you're drinking some Mountain Dew. Just be like, oh, did you know? The ammonia in urine was thought to ideally wash away the yuck. You just gotta get past the whole urine part, I guess. Doctors hate this one trick. Mm. Nero would tax the trade of imported bottled urine. That's how popular it was at this point. Some poor soul with a clipboard would have to stand all day and just be like, yep. In the 12th century, St. Hildegard von Bingen would advise all to wash their mouth with cold water to remove bacteria. Yeah, if only it was that easy, okay? Just one quick sh and spit it out and then you're good? No. I wish it was that easy, pal. Tortoise blood was also used once as mouthwash, alongside goat milk and vinegar. Out of those three options, imagine not picking goat's milk. You're like, hmm, but what year is the tortoise blood? Number eight, bath beans. Not to be confused with bath bombs, bath beans we're talking about. Bath beans, beans in the bath. Bath beans were used thousands of years ago in ancient China. They were these bars, or beans rather, these 
chunks that look like beans. They're made of bean powder, herbs, and much like our bath bombs today, they also included some nice fragrances. Just have a little bit of a, mm. The pancreas of a pig was also commonly used, so it wasn't totally nice. Once the blood was drained, you'd mix it with the bean powder and the nice stuff. Now, originally, it began by using leftover water from cooking rice. Eventually, it became bath beans, which is, you know, AKA soap. Old soap. Some bath beans were loaded with ingredients, much like the bath bombs we can find today, so they were all quite unique. You could make your own little bath bean. Number seven, purple nut sedge weed. Archaeology is fascinating. And no, I'm not just talking about dinosaur stuff. They look at rocks and be like, ah yes, a Viking was here thousands of years ago and he was a Libra. How do you know that? This is so impressive. Ancient sites tell a story. And Karen Hardy, an archeologist with the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies at the University of Barcelona, she found another ancient hygiene practice while studying a prehistoric site in Sedan. Plaque, turns out, can last thousands of years. It calcifies once it mixes with food, then after it's stored below the gums, game over, it's there for good. Specifically, thousands of years ago, it's, it was there to stay. We couldn't really get that out. Hardy was studying remains that were two to 9,000 years old, and in their teeth, they found traces of pollen, dirt, and plant fibers. More specifically, they found evidence of a plant called purple nutsedge. It contained lysine, which is an amino acid that we need to live, so although it didn't taste the best, it sure was vital. Ancient Egyptians used the root for perfume, but this new study shows that purple nutsedge may have been used to prevent tooth decay. They would just chew on roots all day to take care of their teeth. The plant produces antibacterial chemicals, so chewing on them would have been beneficial. Little different than the inside of a tortoise, I'd say. It's definitely a step in the right direction. Number six, smoking. Back in 1665, during a plague in London, you were told to smoke cigarettes because they were considered disinfectants. Sore throat, and eh, smoke this pack of cigarettes. I'm sure that'll help. Help you cough a bit more, if anything. We mentioned before tobacco smoke enemas in like part one or two or three or something over there. But this is just bad advice. Since mouth to mouth wasn't a thing in the 50s, if you were trying to save a drowning victim, you would also have to blow smoke in their face or their butts. Either way, how insane is that? Can you imagine that actually playing out in real time? He's not breathing, quick. Hang on. Cut to 1964, turns out smoking is bad for us. Who knew? Cigarettes were labeled as deadly going forward after that point. It's pretty intense now though, eh? The photos on cigarette packages now are haunting to look at. I still think teenagers smoking to stay in shape is a bit scarier, to be honest, than that image. She's always like, <sighs> her face is just like pulled, it's so scary. Don't smoke. Number five, face care. So we've gathered that folks in the Middle Ages didn't bathe often, but when they did, it was just the necessities, right? They didn't have time to you know, Old Spice, all their stuff up like they do. Then time to dance in the shower and shower backwards. It wasn't a fun event. Hands and face, that's it. That's all you really need anyways. If you couldn't afford to walk and shower, back in the day you'd have to invest in an ewer and basin. You would all have to share the same thing and take turns dipping your hands and face in all day long, just the same. Hmm. Protecting your face was vital for ancient Egyptians 6,000 years ago. They would honor the gods with makeup, but at the same time, it would also protect their skin from the sun. We love that. Today we have like SPF creams. I'm like, this is nothing, this is no fun. Ancient Greeks would use oils to clean their face and they would later scrape it off. And in the 1700s, many believed in saunas and sweat cleansing. The number one trick to clear skin, you guessed it, milk baths. Milk is really the name of the game for this part seven, eh, wow. Goat milk mouthwash, milk baths. I'm gonna go milk a cow after this video. Just because, you know, feels right. Number four, python bile. Yeah, I just said python bile. So if you're eating food right now, just I'll, I'll give you a sec, hit that pause button. Not only pythons also, but numerous animals, their bile would be used to treat ailments. Ulcers of the female genital area, yeah, that's what the doc was giving you. Python bile, have fun. Ancient Chinese physicians would also hand over some elephant bile as well if bad breath was bringing down your game. Elephant bile mixed with water would get rid of halitosis. Honestly, any type of bile, just count me out. I just won't brush, how's that? Taylor, why do you have bad breath? Oh, have you seen the alternative? That's why, Mike, that's why. I almost tripped, but that's why. I almost broke my leg. I'm upset about bile. Number three, malaria. Perhaps one of the most bizarre ways to treat one disease definitely is by getting another. If you suffered from syphilis back in the early 1900s, there wasn't really much help you could get. That was until Austrian physician Julius Wagner Joreg came along. He received the Nobel Bell Prize for this discovery, and as bad as it sounds, it's honestly quite the breakthrough. Julius discovered that malaria-induced fevers were the key to treating syphilis. Yee, nice. 
Now we're, I guess, we don't do this anymore because, well, malaria is still horrible, and a hefty amount of patients lost their lives trying this method. So no, we at Bumblebee do not recommend this method. We have other ways to treat it now. Number two, rabies. It's a part seven, let's talk about rabies. Might as well, this is a haunting list so far. Pre-rabies vaccine, I mean, what the hell did we do? Before 1885, that's when French scientists Louis Pasteur and Emile Roux, they developed the first rabies vaccine. We were pretty much SOL if a rabid animal were to bite you beforehand. I mean, one of the leading theories to prevent the spread of rabies was to not let your dog outside while there was a full moon. You know, that middle-aged bull where every remedy just sounds like a side quest in Skyrim, that kind of stuff. Oh, you'll need one egg and two pigeons. I'm like, what? I have, a, I have strep. What are you talking about? In 16th century Europe, it was a literal joke if you had rabies. Doctors quite literally told you to ingest 40 grains of ground liverwurst and wash it down with 20 grains of pepper and a half pint of milk. That's it. That's how you cure rabies. That's how you do it, I guess. You gotta ingest that each morning for four days in a row. Oh, and you also need to have a cold bath every day for a month. Imagine if this really was the only solution, even today. Just cuts to us in 2022 with iPads, technological advancements, we're creating new vaccines, but in order to cure rabies, you still need to slam some milk and have a bath. It's like, yep, yeah, that's the only way. That's the only way we've done it so far. Hygiene history is insane. I'm gonna push for a part eight. Hit that thumbs up so I can keep talking about this nonsense. This is insane. I learn something horrible every day here. And finally, number one, electricity. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, has been around a lot longer than most of us think. It just didn't work back then, you know? Also, we don't call it shock therapy anymore. We're well past that. Tiny electric currents would be sent through your brain, ideally changing its chemistry, and over 1,000 people a year undergo this treatment. But back in ancient Roman times, this procedure, of course, was a little sketchy, just a little wee bit. They would use electric eels. Yeah, they would hang out with a bunch of electric eels to hopefully relieve a headache. Again, I'd rather just have a headache. I'm not trying to become a Spider-Man villain, okay? I just, I'm nearsighted. Today we believe the seizure aspect is beneficial, but back then it was believed that electricity was the key here. We would drink electrified water and wonder why nothing's happening. Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go, go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy nests? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it, that's actually it. Yeah, we like that, that's it. Number nine, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight. My heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job, a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. But now your stomach is acting up. It's big angy. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious as you know that DEFCON 1 is approaching. You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom or be late for your event or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. 
Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, thirsty. After a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on. I know I could use some hydration after that. Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals. And not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a D-based infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts. Remember that guy? This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene, and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and vinegar was used. What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyed their teeth distinct colors, so then you know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Number five, steam baths. Now looking back and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean, come on, just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras. And my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine, you walk into a bathhouse after a long day, and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. <laughs> I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas. I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. There's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible, especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war. I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, Bath and Body Works part two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith, and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before, and it's coming from your armpit. Puberty-induced body odor. Not to worry. Your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up to school dances with a seafoam pink button-up shirt with the collar popped. 
and a Justin Bieber haircut with a hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh too. That's gross. Number two, the Aztec classic. I'm glad the Aztecs had better hygiene because for once, I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were giving out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart out of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time, really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing, or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot. Kicking off the list at number 10, Karem Lu. It's the 1930s, you're looking for a way to get rid of those upper lip hairs. Well, Karem Lu promises to have your back. They actually promise to have your armpits as well. Yeah, armpit hair and upper lip hair, gone. For good, you say? Wow, that sounds absolutely lovely. Just don't read the fine print, don't flip it and zoom in. Don't zoom in. This cream was applied to the upper lip, but side effects caused hair loss all over your body. And sometimes users would suffer from paralysis. It was on the market for $10, which back in the 1930s, that's a lot, a lot, a lot. Like for hair removal cream, that's a lot, a lot. Those are like Beats headphones, what is this? The Journal of the American Medical Association called this product out as viciously dangerous. Rightfully so, and those who suffered from those harsh side effects collectively sued the company into bankruptcy come 1932. The silent killer here in the cream was thallium, commonly used as rat poison. That ought to do it. Number nine, ancient birth control. Although birth control today is easier than in ancient times, it's still a chore. It's routine, it's something you have to keep track of daily, and things go wrong if you don't and lose track. There's a plethora of side effects. You have to take fake ones just so your body what? Your hormones are all over the place. You can get cancer from these, you can get blood clots potentially. There's really, there's very little research on long-term effects for birth control pills. And also I'm speaking not from experience. There's no birth control pill for guys. This is wildly unfair. I have the most respect. These pills mess you up. My friends will tell me their side effects and I can't believe it. You're all troopers. Ancient Egyptians, their method of ancient birth control was by mixing acacia fruit with honey and ground dates. This paste would then be used directly, and believe it or not, it was rather effective. Acacia gum ferments and then turns into lactic acid, which can prevent pregnancy. Not all of these ancient methods worked like this. There's another that's really bizarre, and I'll save that for the end. It's absolutely insane, I can't believe it. We'll ease our way there, you know, we'll, we'll start nice. Number eight, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters were introduced and as well as the horrifying and deadly mascara, Lash Lure. This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical, P-phenylidamine. That's how you know it's bad, when you can't even pronounce the thing. This mascara left blisters all over your face, your eyelids, the whole thing, it was really bad. There was eventually a death in 1933. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and then passed away. It was so bad that later that year, her before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. It was a horrible incident, but a good way to get the attention from higher ups, so something like this never happens again. 
Lash Lure was then the first product in history that was removed from stores entirely, so it worked. We're in the middle of something kind of similar now, I think. Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking right there on the packaging. The girl with the face. Could we see the day smoking is outlawed? I don't know, I feel like we're close. It's caused quite a few more deaths than Lash Lure, that's all I'm saying. Number seven, bad toothpaste. Doramad toothpaste was advertised in the 1920s. The ad shows a blonde lady with a lovely smile. Some would even say glowing. Right below reads Doramad radioactive toothpaste. Radioactive toothpaste, I've uh, hmm, that sounds bad. I've played enough Fallout to know that radioactive toothpaste probably isn't a great product, especially to put in and around your mouth. It even loudly advertises its radioactive ingredients. Can you imagine this? Increase the defense of teeth and gums. The cells are loaded with new life energy. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. That last one I made up, but you can't tell, right? How insane is this? This secret ingredient to shinier smiles and brighter futures was thorium. The god of thunder does not brush with thorium. He uses it to polish his hammer. Yeah, it's very toxic. Number six, Gorad's cream. Once advertised as a magic beautifier, doesn't that sound like a neat time? Gorad's Oriental Cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, whatever Paul Rudd's doing, whatever his secret is, we're still trying to figure that one out. That sort of thing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very Chamber of Horrors style. This magic ingredient that was meant to magically make you beautiful had some magic mercury in it. Not something you want on your face, yeah, at all. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes and even her neck. Mercury poisoning is not fun. Number five, moss. We're halfway through and I'll say it again. I'll remind you all again, I have the utmost respect for you ladies. As a guy doing this list and like writing this list, I mean the things you had to craft back then and then, you know, put, oh my lord. For example, going back to the 10th century, this was a time long before Tampax was ever even a thing. Women were forced to get creative when it came to personal hygiene. They had to just figure it out themselves and literally collect grass or moss, sheepskin lined with cotton. It was mostly moss all the time. You all are absolute troopers. If it wasn't moss, other solutions were small pieces of wood with lint wrapped around it. Number four. Q-tips. If you haven't heard, Q-tips are not for your ears. Yeah, I thought this was a rumor. Turns out we're all lawbreakers. I use two at the same time if I'm in a rush. No, flip them. I'm a vigilante when it comes to Q-tips. Q-tips were invented in 1923 by Leo Gertzenzang, right after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Kinda sounds like his wife invented Q-tips, but okay, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-Tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-Tips. That's like a Sweet Baby Rays, that barbecue sauce. Oh, so good. Have they just called it Sweet Rays? Maybe they give it up to the baby? I don't know. You have to try and work it out. I don't know what the bit is, but I'm like, hey, that's a great sauce, and I just thought of that sauce. Baby Rays, Baby Gays. Back in those days, Q-Tips were dipped in boric acid, and they were intended to sterilize wounds. Yeah, we're just out here like, my eyes roll back every time. I get so, I go way too deep. I get too deeper, I'm like, oh, it's gone. Huh, there it is, magic, I'm a magician. After this, there were even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams. It's like Apple, like I, iPad, iPhone, the other eye stuff. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be in your ears? What's that about? Well, in 2008, Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax into your ear canal, leading to possible infections more than anything. When Cheesebro Ponds bought the company back in 1962, they added a warning on the box, a warning that we and I gladly still ignore. Just talking about this, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go clean my stuff out. Mm. I have Q-tips in my bag, literally, I'm always prepared. Always strapped. Number three, hair removal trick. In the late 19th century, something called thallium actate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, which even today is the talk of the town. Laser off that peach fuzz for good. Zero. Gone. Thallium was used back in the day, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. But even so, thallium didn't do anything per se about the ringworm, it just caused the patient's hair to fall off. So the ringworm was then easier to find. I'd prefer a haircut if you ask me, but sure. Thallium does the trick as well. Eventually, thallium was sold as a cream, a toxic cream. It should never touch your skin at all, and it's a face cream. Are you kidding? This thing was once rat poison as well, and now we're rubbing it around like it's Bath and Body Works Noel cream. It's my favorite cream, the green one. Oh, God, gone in two days. 
This was outlawed, thankfully, in the 30s, but it had to get bad pretty first. Number two. Aqua Tifana. Going back to the 1600s for this one. Also, if you're a murderino, you'll enjoy this bit of dark history. Aqua Tifana was a cosmetic that was sold to women in the early 1630s. It was a cosmetic that doubled as a poison. Yeah, sneaky, right? Some Assassin's Creed going on here. The origins of this deadly cosmetic that was sold and responsible for around like 600 deaths is pretty wild. So back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofana Diamato, they both created this poison. They worked together and created it so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. But eventually Teofana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Teofana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, coming in at number one, more ancient birth control. Okay, we kicked this list off catching up with ancient Egyptians and the uh, aid of acacia trees and all that jazz. So I figured we'd end on a ridiculous birth control method from the ancient Roman days. Seranus, who was known as a Greek gynecologist back then, his idea for Planned Parenthood was not a good one. It was not a good idea. He wrote that after you, you know, bump uglies, in order to prevent pregnancy, the woman must squat and sneeze. First of all, no, not a chance, no, no. And also, if you're thinking about it, no. Secondly, who can sneeze on demand? I certainly can't. I had a really nice time tonight, cheers. That's not, that's not possible, no. Many methods from the past are questionable. In ancient China, it was commonly told that drinking hot mercury could prevent pregnancy. Yeah, leave mercury away from your body, that will literally kill you. Ancient Greeks would drink blacksmith water because they too thought the exposure to lead could prevent getting pregnant. This idea came back around World War I as well. Women were working in factories and actually trying to get exposed to lead. That was the whole idea. Bad. These are pretty dark, so I'll leave you on this one. In the Dark Ages, European women wore amulets made of weasel testicles to magically ward off pregnancies. Poor weasels. Black magic is the worst, isn't it? Number 10, the switchblade comb. Hey, leather jackets, smacking jukeboxes, and a switchblade knife. Nobody was cooler than the Fonz on Happy Days. Well, maybe your uncle. Everybody has a cool uncle. But something I just think is silly, or something a lot of men probably use today, or at least the super cool guys who have no idea what or who the Fonz is, the switchblade comb. Basically, it's the same thing as a switchblade, but instead of a small blade, you got something to comb your hair with. Because when you're a man, you have to look fresh and tough at the same time. Trust me, ladies, it's, it's how we operate. Gotta look tough, gotta look mean. And kick the jukebox, Hey, Number nine, the ball jacuzzi. I don't know about you guys, but there is nothing better than a nice hot tub. I'd like to say I spent a lot of time in hot tubs with cute girls. However, due to my financial situation, however, most of the hot tubbing that I've done has been at public pools where I shared a hot tub with older Italian and Greek men who I swear were still wearing sweaters, but that was just their hair. Speaking of hair and saggy skin, meet the Tescuzzi, a tiny hot tub for the Pisha deal and two matzo balls. Hey, I understand, your undercarriage has to stay clean and honestly, I would love one. Chris and I were talking about we want one, we might even share one. Who knows? Number eight, the all-in-one. All right, man, this one goes out to us. The manly men, the dads, the sons, the brothers. The men who work all day and night and still have time for their family. I appreciate you and I see you, brother. Want to know why we have so much time, ladies? Well, that's because we've cut back on time in the shower with a very five-head invention. We call it body wash or face wash. Or shampoo, because we use it for everything, three in one. Yes, that's right. If we buy a body wash product, that means it will be used all over our bodies. No time for L'Oreal Pantene or that purple shampoo with the kangaroo. We speed run shower so we can get back into doing the things that you ladies love. Like not putting the toilet seat down. Number seven, king of the porcelain throne. Kings, I hear you. Life can be busy, and the shower speed run is not the only product that we've invented. Here's another shout out to all my kings who take extra time while sitting upon the porcelain throne. I salute you. Yes, that's right. Besides doing the hygienic process of evacuating one's bowels, we take a mental health break in the bathroom. A time to check in, relax, 
take inventory, and take a breath of some not so fresh air. Especially if you ate Taco Bell the night before. Is it strange to sit there in that situation? Perhaps. But like any other guru, we need a space to feel our spirituality. Would Yoda be Yoda if he didn't meditate? Mmm, sit on the toilet, I will. Number six, the beard apron. This is just so smart, and I'm seriously considering buying one because this is the bane of my existence. Sometimes the lumberjack look is too much for me, and the closer I get to looking like Chris Farley, the better. I think I have a great motivational speaker impression. Maybe I'll show you guys one day. We'll see. I don't know. However, when shaving my beard, I have nowhere to go, and it's too cold in the winter to do it outside, so. That's why this is so smart. Basically, it's an apron that you post up like a hammock. So when you're shaving down those chiseled cheekbones of yours, all the little hairs fall into the apron. That way your GF can't yell at you because there's no mess to be made. Necessity truly is the mother of all invention. Number five, bacon products. Who doesn't love bacon, right? Bacon is delicious. Bacon is a delicious meat that can be enjoyed for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Personally, there was nothing like waking up on a Saturday morning as a kid to play some GameCube and eat bacon and eggs, my favorite. I was a tubby kid and I was easy to impress. However, while bacon may not be the king of the breakfast table, it is the bootleg flavor of fragrance and the non-food market. It seems every time there's a store, gift shop, or novelties being sold, a bacon flavored, scented, or themed product is there for men. And it's not far behind. Because yes, we are tough and rugged. And we eat meat because we're cowboys. So that also means we want breath mints that are artificially bacon flavored, right? No, we don't. They taste horrible. It's awful. No one wants that. Nobody wants that. Number four, bath bomb. Call it genius marketing, crazy society, or people wasting money, but a lot of hygiene beauty products that women purchase, men do too. They just gotta repackage it and inject it with 300 cc's of testosterone because men. Take the hand grenade bath bomb for instance. Taking bath bomb to a whole other level. Yes, the one I saw while researching was very colorful and it looked like it had a fruity scent, but it was shaped like a hand grenade from the second world war. No way an adult man would fall for that, right? Pfft, no. Chris, you see my rubber ducky? Number three, the man bun. Honestly, I don't mind this trend. I actually think it looks good. Certainly better than the mullets of the 90s. There's no way you can tell me mullets look better than man buns. You just can't. The man buns are actually somewhat organized. Especially if dudes grow them out and maintain them. However, what is strange to me is the man bun add-on. Yeah, it's like a man bun extension. You just like a clip-on. Basically, look like the guy who plays Wonderwall at every party for the low, low price of $19.99. I can't be dissing too much, though, because I wore a clip-on tie to the ninth grade. But the girls thought I was cute? I think? I think so. Number two, gendered products. Another broad stroke here, but when things get placed into categories, there's always two colors that get used. Pink for girls, blue for boys. While I'm not sure whether colors are actually masculine or feminine themselves, it has been hardwired into most of us, that's just how it goes. Anything plastered in blue or male-like imagery, it's what's meant for men. I, however, as a kid, had an absolute five-head play. To protect my valuables from thieves and villains in the night, I always chose something that was girl-themed, pink, or something a boy wouldn't pick. As I thought, if presented with my stolen items, I could always identify them since only a boy would choose girly stuff. From my Nintendo DS to my notebooks and honestly everything in between. I, hot pink was in and Chetty made it work. I thought the plan was foolproof. I, I never really thought though what would happen if a girl took my stuff though. That, that, that didn't, I didn't really think that wouldn't work for that, would it? No, it wouldn't. Number one, wine in a can. This one is just so silly to me, and for any wine connoisseurs out there, take this with a grain of salt. I'm no sommelier, but I enjoyed the odd glass of wine, even if it comes from a box. I always thought the wine glass was elegant, higher class, but that doesn't mean you have to be higher class to drink it, or be less masculine. Well, now there's wine in a can for men, because we can't have flimsy glasses. We'll break those glasses because we're so strong. Oh, yeah. Number 10, suck on a clove. Bad oral hygiene was not permitted back in ancient China. Bad breath, even less so. For example, if you were going to be seeing the emperor, it was required that you suck on a clove beforehand to make your breath all nice and fresh, just in case. I think I'm going to use that as an insult. I'm not going to say it again because I feel like, no. Yes, I like this. Other than breath fresheners, the ancient Chinese used primitive toothbrushes made of willow branches that were rinsed clean and then chewed to make all hairy and stuff. And then dipped in some of this tooth cleaning powder made of a bunch of different ingredients like pork teeth, saponin, ginger, cooked remina glutinosa, mulu, eclipta, lotus leaf, 
green salt, and other things I don't want to struggle to pronounce. Okay. Before that though, they would also use salty warm water as a mouthwash, which would make their teeth more firm and help clean them. I actually do this uh, like every once in a while after I brush my teeth too. It's actually really good for your gums. These ancient Chinese knew what was up. Number nine, bathing. In ancient China, the etiquette of a gentleman demanded that he wash his hands five times a day, take a bath every fifth day, and wash his hair every third day. Bathing every day was a bit of a superstitious no-no, started by northern Chinese societies that would actively avoid cold water or bathing in the winter to avoid getting a cold altogether. And not bathing at all was considered barbaric, like those pesky Mongols who hated bathing and who were hated by the Chinese. Honestly, that part is, is kind of fair. They, they, they kind of sucked. So yeah, to kind of reach a nice midpoint, the norm was to wash once every five days. But that was for the nobility. The common people had access to giant bathhouses where they would go, and I mean, they could go whenever they wanted, really. I shower every morning. I have heard that's bad, but I don't think I'd willingly go for like five days without washing, so I don't know. Maybe I gotta move it to every other day. I, somebody give me advice, please. Let's move on, I, let's just move on. Number eight, rice water. So, the Chinese washed like once a week. That's fine, but how did they wash? What did they use? Well, in the beginning, it was actually common to bathe using rice water as your go-to. It would be used as both body wash and shampoo. The rice water was really good at removing oil and keeping that hair and scalp nice and beautiful as well as keeping skin nice and silky smooth. The rice water also contains starch, protein, and vitamins that are really good for us. It helped with lower back pain, frostbite, and it was really good to help relieve some of the exhaustion after a long day. Most baths are good at that, honestly. The Chinese also used honey locust that was really good for eliminating dirt and treating rheumatism and ringworm. Both rice water and honey locust were used for doing laundry as well, with honey locust keeping clothes unfaded and in good condition. As far as ancient cultures go, the Chinese are already far ahead and we're only on the eighth point. Number seven, threading. Bet you didn't know that hair was not really people's favorite thing in ancient China. I saw somewhere that they even referred to it as thread-like things of troubles. Why the hate? I don't know, but it was part of the reason monks would completely get rid of it. Other people would remove their hair too, and one way of doing that was the practice of threading. A form of hair removal that is still a thing we do today, actually. Now, I apologize if I mess this up, I've never had it done, but threading basically consists of a thin cotton or polyester thread that is doubled, then twisted, and then it's rolled over areas of unwanted hair, plucking the hair at the follicle level. In our modern day and age, it's typically used for eyebrows to shape them and keep them gorgeous. In ancient China, they would use threading to deal with facial hair, which, I mean, I guess eyebrows kind of count as facial hair, so. Threading isn't really opportune for arm or leg hair though, so it's just a pure facial thing. Good to know. Number six, combs. Yeah, some people didn't like hair, but those who deal with it made sure to keep that stuff nice and combed. Combs were all the rage. A province of China even got the nickname of the home of combs, which is a great name. Whether they would be made of wood, stone, or animal bone, many combs were made with care and craftsmanship. Comb shops would open up all over the show and people would carry combs as accessories. And they'd come in all sizes. Get yourself a comb for the weekends, a large comb to get all your hair at once, a comb to hold your hair in place. Heck, get a comb to help weed out those pesky lice. Number five, lice. Yes, while we're talking about hair care, why not touch on the subject of lice? It's a problem everywhere, not just in your elementary school. Ancient China had lice problems just like ancient Egypt did. While almost everyone chose the path of baldness in Egypt, it was not so in China. No, other than honey locusts and rice water to clean your hair, one of the common practices to deal with lice was to, um, well, it was to eat the lice that you picked out of your hair. Hey, grub is grub, but I think, uh, I think I'd like to move on from this topic now. Let's, let's go, let's go, let's get the heck out. Number four, poo poo stick. I'm sorry that we have to talk about this, but actually, you know what, I'm not that sorry. Just as it does now, going to drop the kids off at the pool in ancient China left you with the task of cleaning yourself up afterwards. Wiping your bottom, that's what I'm talking about. Now, they did have paper back in ancient China, like we talked about in our ancient Chinese inventions video, but paper was expensive and the only ones who really used it were the emperor and royalty like him who would use straw paper. 
Before that, and for everyone else, people would use a stick-like tool called a chugi. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Which was basically bamboo strips that were shaped to be thin and flat and slightly wide with rounded edges. Some of these even had great water absorption and a lovely scent. Those who were a bit more fortunate would then wash with water, kind of like an ancient bidet, and then use some good smelling stuff to make it all better. Other than that, a lot of people were cool with using leaves or sticks and stones, and honestly, whatever could do the trick, really. I mean, when you gotta go, you gotta go. Number three, using dirt to clean? Okay, okay, not dirt, but soil. Ancient cultures, including the ancient Chinese, would use soil as a tool in cleaning which actually had the benefit of being able to help remove oil stains. Now how did this happen? Apparently, it is believed to be caused by the alkaline qualities of the soil that really helps with the removal of oil. Soil and oil, I did not like that. Which the Chinese actually seemed to figure out how to specifically utilize. The Chinese used a kind of natural alkali to clean their clothes, which evolved to be scented to help keep the clothes nice and funky smelling. The use of this stuff was so popular that there were tons of scented alkali stores that opened up around China, with some even becoming pretty famous. Maybe not unusual, but definitely very interesting and a precursor to modern laundry soaps. So, hmm. Number two, water purification. Well, this may be considered more of a health thing than a hygiene thing. I mean, I'd argue that hygiene is health, so get at me. <laughs> the ancient Chinese discovered and made extensive use of groundwater for drinking, and they kept record of how they would keep their wells and well water nice and clean. The construction of the wells was pretty important, with the bottom of the wells regularly being dredged to keep the water clean. The inner walls of the wells were reinforced with ceramic bricks and tiles to stop that pesky soil and other impurities from falling into the water, and the openings of the wells were covered to safeguard against contamination from above the ground. The cleaning of wells was even institutionalized as a feast in some places. So cleaner water and food, it's a win-win. Knowing early on that drinking water could make them pretty sick, the Chinese boiled their water and allowed the sediment to settle before using it for cooking and drinking. They also knew what was up with water. They just knew what was up in general. It's pretty great. Okay, let's move on. I'm talking too much. Number one, no stink. Smelling funky fresh and clean was all the rage, as it should be today too. I ain't trying to be on the subway with a nose full of body odor, just as I wouldn't wish to submit anyone else to that. To be fair, not everyone knows they stanky and some people don't get a choice, but back in ancient China, those who were wealthy enough would spice up their weekly baths with roots, flowers, peppers, ginger, and all that yummy smelling goodness to basically create a lovely smelling cleansing soup to plop themselves into. Women would also carry around aromatic pouches that would just keep a nice smell around them at all times. Those who were not as wealthy would have to find other means to keep things fresh though. One that I'm not too sure would actually help smell-wise was applying their own pee-pee to their pits once a year on New Year's. This was done as a kind of a disinfectant. But like I said, I'm, I'm not too sure about this one, but if anyone has the knowledge, uh, firsthand or otherwise, keep it to yourself. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own, they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night, and feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. 
Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated, but also you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad. But ancient Egyptians, eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's, that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, get this man a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kind of good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds, and cashews put together, ground up, and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool, and boom, breath mints. I like it. I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists. Or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. Breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more, it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a, that's more of a home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain, why did I do this to myself? Contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That Allison really helps. 
Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots, with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible, that's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, mm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad, I can't lie. It does, and it likely was for some, but it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important, especially in the marshy areas around the Nile where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. <laughs> Neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month, we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap for starters. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body and then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices all that stuff turpentine turpentines all the time and teens just all in there washing it out then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days that's a long time but around day 40 you would stuff it with sand now come day 70 finally that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages then the sarcophagus awaits forever really and then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber now it's we don't do it it's not as fun anymore we don't put our organs in jars we don't stuff anyone with sand we should, you know what, we should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it, I think it's time. Yeah. And coming in at number 10, baths. From bath bombs to jacuzzis, when did people exactly start warming up that cold river water to sit in for some R&R? &R? Well, apparently the Romans were the first to think about warming her up. I don't really know if they had it in mind that warm water works better and faster to clean and rid of microparticles and had more of a, oh, mentality. But one way or another, they did it. Were they really ahead of their time, though? The first bathhouses have been discovered in Rome, approximately being built somewhere in the second century BC. The first of its kind, from a river of cold water to the abundance of over 500 steaming prominent bathhouses. You could pamper yourself head to toe for a small price, small enough so that even the poorest could bathe. That's a lot of small business owners. Hottest water in town, step right up, step right up. The Romans came up with an idea to build a spa house thing which could be flooded and heated by the floor beneath it. With a giant fireplace inside the spa, it was lit by hand and blown through the vents under the floor. Damn, they were smart, huh? Hot and steamy and good for the body. And clean, well, cleaner. The bathhouse was a technology of its own and it seemed like humanity was headed in the right direction. 
No, no they were not. Number nine. Wiping. Do as the Romans did. It's thought that these people thought of literally everything before us. Oh yeah? How about pogo sticks? You think of that? Huh? pogo -onitis? No. No, you didn't. Look that up, did they? Over the years I've had some pretty shitty jobs, but nothing as shitty as this one. Literally. Uh, sire, would you like fronteth to backeth or backeth to fronteth today, sire? That's right, there was a job for that. People had to have had started wiping at some point, right? But who exactly and when? The groom of the stool. Chief Gentlewoman of the Privy Chamber. Call it whatever you like, we know what they did. So what exactly did they wipe with? Well, usually hay, sticks, fur, or even seashells. Every single one of those sounds itchy and terrible. I know what Charmin can do sometimes, and I can't imagine what a piece of oak could have done back then. Was there splinter taker routers as well? I can't help but feel although how painful and stinky it was, I'm sure there was at least one shared laugh, a little quality time spent with some royalty to say the least, Although this career is speculated, both King Charles I and King James I had them, so unless they decided they wanted to do that after them, someone must have continued doing it. I hope for a pretty penny at least. Those waste management dudes have pretty good benefits. Filing your taxes looking for a job description? Uh, ah yes, here it is, wiper. Number 8. Urine. Okay, is this just going to be disgusting the entire time? Well the answer is yes. History is pretty disgusting. Okay, this one is weird because right when we think we figured it all out, something jarring happens. Like a jar of piss and all the health benefits it had throughout history. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Well, at least they thought it did. In ancient Rome, not only was this liquid gold sold for, well, gold, it was often traded as a prominent good, sold for its multitude of healing purposes. You see, people have been using urine for thousands of years. That's right, this destructive, toxic bodily fluid could be repurposed, salvaged into many different topicals and treatments. From hair loss to your daily skincare routine, it was not only great for staining and softening leather made for shoes and clothes, it was a natural teeth whitener and antiseptic. <laughs> That's right, from ancient Rome to as late as the 20th century, people have been tinkering and tailoring with their pee. Egyptians did it, Greeks did it, Urine is the body's natural antiseptic and was soon turning septic. Like the science behind this alone is what your buddy tells you, you know what I mean? Oh, rolled ankle? Yeah, yeah, just piss on it. Got ghosts? Ah, just pee on it. The ailment for all your needs. Disgusting. Number seven, teeth. Invented in 1488 by Sir Robert Tooth. Okay, I'm joking, no. Teeth were never officially invented, but what we did for them and how we cared for them had people scratching their heads for the last millennia. We've all had a toothache at some point in our lives, so they must have had them back then. In fact, oral hygiene was utterly disgusting. I didn't brush my teeth after my coffee and I can already feel it. Ew. People's teeth were so bad throughout history that dentists were actually training and teaching each other what to do about the huge toothworm problem. That's right. Imagine worms growing inside your teeth. Well, due to the swelling and pressure, people thought there were actual bugs or evil spirits living within their sore tooth, serving them extreme pain. Nope, just an infection. You need a root canal. Oh, and actual worms and bugs living in the tooth. Uh, yeah, you see this gray area right here? Uh, that's a ladybug, right? It's medieval England and things were pretty medieval. Right down to the surgery and if you had an impacted wisdom tooth, well, that wasn't covered. England, 400 AD. People started this new trend of oral hygiene cleaning but it wasn't spin brushes and floss, no more like mint and vinegar and prayer. Just kind of swoosh it all around in your mouth and wipe your teeth with your shirt and call it another year. If you were lucky enough to rinse your mouth out at the time, then you could have saved yourself a visit to the medieval dentist chair. Well, actually just a slab of rock you sit up against and have a friend who's good at ripping. And there you go, buddy. Hey, wake up. The infection alone from the dirty tools going into your mouth is making me itchy. I feel like my breath stinks more now after I've read this topic. Anybody have any gum? Number six. Toilet paper. Finally, something we recognize. Invented originally in China in 851 from the Tang Dynasty, these soft fabric sheets were designed for, well, you know what it was designed for, but yes, mostly the emperor's bathroom breaks and soon caught on for the commonwealth as well. The higher the class, the softer and more luxurious the material. From leather to silk, butts were seeing a kinder, gentler side of hygiene. Two ply bark versus four ply silk. The use of toilet paper throughout Europe is a messy one. Again, wipers and hay and stuff like that. It wasn't until the toilet paper rule created by Joseph Gaiety in 1857 that this hygiene method would solidify and stay for keeps. 
The classic under versus over is the tale as old as time. You ever want to get into a quick argument at someone's house? Just peek in the loo, see if they're rocking beard or mullet. It's the simplest way to have a know-it-all show you the patent and tell you how to wipe your own ass. Charmin'. Number five, the great stink. Um, the what, what? Oh, no, 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 yeah, I read that right. The Great Stink of 1858 was an event in central London in the summer, during which the hot weather exaggerated and amplified the smell of untreated human waste and gunk that had washed up on both in and on the banks of the River Thames. The problem had been growing for years with an out-of-date technology and overflowing sewage system that emptied directly into the river. The stank was thought to have been the root cause of a number of contagious diseases and three outbreaks of cholera before it was agreed upon that a small problem was emerging. You think? Long story short, all the garbage, human waste, bloated bodies were all just washing up around the same time. Hey, I caught one! No, oh, that's an arm. Okay. And just cooking in all that sun all day? I know what August feels like and I've smelt my garage and garbage day and I can't imagine the smell already in central London at that time. And for people to have complained so much that it was even stinkier, that's absolutely rotten. Number four, nose gaze. I was just thinking, where are all these inventions and blueprints on how to stop the smell? If you can knit metal into a crop top, you can cover your mouth and nose, can't you? Well, close enough. Nosegays were invented. Basically just big nose plugs one would wear day to day to drown out the smell of absolute filth. Just plug it up and ignore it was their mentality. A makeshift wad of bunched up herbs and flowers shoved up your nose, blocking the nasal cavity from the stank that followed. Just see number five. A poo-pourri for each nostril. Would this make things worse, ignoring the smell? Wouldn't that make it even harder to find out where it's coming from? Nope, just band-aid it. It's gonna disappear on its own. We're humans, we're designed to smell stuff for our own survival. The smell is like what lets us know not to go down there. Oh, no, no. Like wouldn't everything just smell like roses at that point? These people were trying to avoid the stinky streets because that actually meant that's where the infection and disease was actually hanging out. The blind leading the blind. Number three, flushing. Okay, we're making some ground here. We got toilet paper, we got something for the smell. So now where do we put it? Well, plumbing and flushing wasn't connected to each house like it is today. See, the Greeks and Romans had it down to a science. They built drainage systems and learned from the ancient Mesopotamian people how to exactly deal with the problem of waste. A system of pipes, tubes, and drains. The bathroom problem seemed like an easy solution. Use gravity downhill to dispose of the waste outside the city. And here's the kicker. It can even be reused and repurposed at the end as an irrigation system, further nurturing the farming of crops. No, that's good, no, he's right. And then it disappears and literally goes downhill again. After the Roman Empire had fallen, this European dark sanitation era had begun and hygiene sorta of just slipped away. People weren't really concerned with things like disease and plague and instead leaned into real science like witchcraft or burning cats for fun. You know, important stuff. It wasn't until about the mid 1850s where people revisited this age old problem and recreated and did exactly the same thing science we already knew. Things were unnecessarily stinky for way too long. It wasn't until the British colonies started tinkering in Boston around the 1700s that proper piping and toiletry transport was eventually built and catalogued. Thus was born the first sanitation system, again. And we still see it today, thank God. Number two, disinfectants. How did people exactly know if something was clean or not? They couldn't have just seen the particles back then. Let's hear a chamber pot. It smells clean. People were plugging their noses so they couldn't even smell anything. They couldn't smell if it was clean or not. There certainly wasn't a demand for a fresh lemon scent that we're all used to. This was the birth of some basic antiseptic. Chemists were mixing and mashing chemicals and a new form of cleaning agent was introduced in the 1890s by German chemist science Gustav Ruppenstrauch in hopes to rid the country of the overflowing cholera epidemic and seize the spread of germs and the disease. By mixing benzalkonium and hydrogen peroxide, you were left with a chemical compound that would destroy and clean infections on medical patients. Light bulb. Thus leaning towards the direction of an all-purpose surface cleaner, killing bacteria and ridding the area of harmful toxins. And drum roll please, Lysol was created. That's right, the same Lysol we use today. This was a push in the right way for humanity. An easy to use liquid cleaner that would aid disinfecting everything in its way. I've seen the bottle and the Wemyss labels. Must have been even stronger back then too. Hope no one spilled it on themselves in testing. 
Ooh, ouch, that is a class one chemical burn. <laughs> You're just gonna wanna pee on that for 12 to 13 days. And number one, soap. Finally, the end of all our ailments. Soap, the answer. Well, not really. See, it's been around since the Romans because they literally did everything before us and stop bragging, we get it. Made out of animal fats, ash, and mostly lye, these makeshift balls of soap were invented years ago. And then forgotten, and then invented again, and then forgotten again. Cleanliness was loose, remember, and it was almost uncool to believe in science, and it wasn't really until the mass production of this chemical detergent that it really stuck. Soap was predominantly sold produced and commercialized in the late 1800s. By this time, scientists were fiddling around with things like Lysol and more chemical compounds, sparking its way to the study of germs, a vital step towards large-scale soap production. And it actually started in 1791, when a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, patented a system for making soda ash from salt, at which point added with animal fat, and there you have it. The slippery bar we're all used to today. The discovery made soap making one of America's fastest growing industries in 1850. And it seemed from then on in it was only up. It's crazy to think that someone at this time, even after soap was invented, were still spit shining surgical instruments to be clean. That's good. Kicking off our list at number 10, seam squirrels. I love squirrels, being Canadian, we see quite a bit of them. They're a little too friendly for me at times, but they're great. During the Old West era, seam squirrels were, well, not what you think. Personal hygiene was not a priority for many people back then, obviously, and lice infestations were unfortunately quite common. Now, the type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as body lice, which is pretty horrible. That could be found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. Yeah, not actually a squirrel at all, it's just body lice. Gotcha. Body lice, of course, was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, and relapsing fever. Relapsing fever? I haven't even heard of that one. That's terrible. These diseases were often fatal because, you know, ye Old West, and many people in the Old West succumbed to them. To combat the spread of lice and the, you know, one of many diseases that they carried, people in the Old West often resorted to extreme measures, such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely. That's why you see old cowboys and they look like they're stress, they have no hair, their clothes are just gone. You're like, what happened? Lice, lice happened. Some people also used remedies like vinegar and kerosene to try and kill the lice. So yeah, it was a rough time either way. Overall, lice infestations were a significant health concern during the Old West era, and they played a significant role in the spread of disease. Yeah, it wasn't just rats in the medieval era, it was also lice which is even grosser, in my opinion. Number nine, Old West Dental. I could use some Old West Dental recently. I got a, I'm chewing on one side right now, you know what I mean? In the Old West, dental hygiene was not a priority for everyone, they couldn't afford it. And also, dental care was often very sparse. You couldn't really find it anywhere, for that matter. People generally didn't have access to modern dental tools or products, and many did not have regular access to any dentists at any point in their life, which is a sad but real fact. That would suck, I'm terrified. However, there were some basic dental hygiene practices that people in the Old West may have followed to keep their teeth, you know, somewhat in their heads, you know, keep their gums not rotten. Didn't do much, but did something. There were toothbrushes. Not many, but you know, wasn't as good as Oral-B. There's some stuff. More often than not, you'd have to use twigs or chew on mint, that kind of natural survivor stuff. Some people may have also used a cloth or a rag to rub their teeth clean. Yeah, don't forget your tooth cloth before you go on vacation, I guess. You gotta and put it back in your pocket. Your old woody teeth, gotta rub those. Access to professional dental care was limited in the Old West. Some towns, some, had dentists, but all they did back then was just pull out the problem. They didn't give you a crown. They're like, which one hurts? All right, get out of here. All without anesthesia. So that's a great time. You're gonna remember all of it. Other options included a community toothbrush, which is hilarious to think about and also so sad. Yeah, some public establishments had a public toothbrush. Can you imagine? Go out, have a little brush, check your teeth. All right, cool. I'm gonna go back to the bar. I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna actually throw up right now. Number eight, no spitting. Spitting was a common habit back in the Old West. You see it in movies and parodies. They're always spitting on the ground and stuff. Well, it's because it's real. It's a real fact right there. It wasn't a officially outlawed. However, many towns and cities did prohibit spitting on sidewalks and inside of public buildings, because yeah, please don't do that. Thank you so much, sir. This was largely due to concerns about hygiene and of course, like I said earlier, the spread of disease. In addition, spitting was considered rude and uncivilized behavior. Yeah, of course, and many people were offended by it. Middle of conversation, guy just spits in between your feet. I'm like, wait, don't do that. Please don't do that ever again. Some businesses even had signs asking customers to not spit on 
the floor. Can you imagine what kind of hole you're in? You have to ask people not to do that. There was also social norms in place that discouraged spitting in certain situations. For example, it was considered impolite to spit in the presence of a woman or in formal settings, which, yeah, I agree, still do that today. That's great. Despite these efforts to discourage spitting, it remained a common practice among cowboys, miners, and other workers in ye old west. They're like, yeah, I have shit in my mouth. I don't know, we don't have water. I'm gonna spit, sorry. Number seven, communal towels. Ugh, oh, this one's so rough. It's exactly what you think it is. It was a ride. Today we have paper towels that you pump like 13 times just to get a little sheet. Or sometimes if you're lucky, that Dyson air drying thing where you just dip your hands in for like 13 seconds and then it's done. You're like, oh, the future is here. That's always fun, that one. Back in the old west, communal towels were often used in public restrooms and other shared spaces. Yeah, just one towel for all, just to dap off everything that's wet or damp back then, ew. These towels were usually made of cloth and hung on a rack for multiple people to use just in public, like it's your bathroom. While this may seem unhygienic by our modern standards now, it was a common practice at the time. So yeah, I don't know, we can laugh a bit, I guess. People were generally less concerned about the spread of germs and diseases back then, and communal towels were convenient, and they were a cost-effective option for public spaces. However, with the rise of awarenesses about hygiene and germs and all that nasty stuff, the use of these towels eventually fell out of favor in the earliest 20th century. Thank God. Imagine dapping off your lips after eating some wings with a communal towel. Some cowboy is, you know, huh, and then he, huh, and then, huh, 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 and then you come in and wipe your, that's so gross. Number six, hair care? Yeah, I added a question mark there because, I don't know, not much TLC going on on top back then. Throughout history, people have used a variety of natural ingredients for hair care. Nowadays, guys have it too easy. It's like Axe five in one. It's like hair, armpits, legs, feet, all in, like, no way you can do all of that. Popular methods in the Old West were whiskey and castor oil. Yep, all on your big exposed head, right in the sun, there you go. Pantene Pro-V wasn't a thing then, so folks were rubbing their heads clean with castor oil, that's a nightmare. Whiskey was believed to help cleanse the scalp and often promote hair growth, while the castor oil, that option, that was thought to moisturize and condition the hair, so that'd be a fun two-in-one back then, that's great, put that in the stocking. These ingredients were readily available and most importantly, they were affordable, making them popular, but also, realistically, it was their only option. The guys doing whiskey, he's like, yeah, let's clean it up. Clean up top, it's so hot. It's like, ugh, really burns. Number five, medical shows. Today, medical shows, they're fascinating. Dr. Pipple Popper, I'll watch that all day while I eat. I don't even care, I'm disgusting like that. Dude's getting mashed potatoes squeezed out of their back, so I'm like, ah, let's go, I love it. I'm slapping that thumbs up, it's my shit. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s, you know, they had what's called medicinal showmen. These are, what an absolute joke, what a con. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, everything one needs to live a happy and comfortable Western life, but they were full of lies. None of this shit is true. These professional medicinal showmen would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixirs, right? These shows, bunch of bullshit. They would call up random audience members, that guy that ran ahead, and then use one of these elixirs and magically treat their ailment on the spot in front of the public, right? Almost as if it was a magic show. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any and all illness. But in reality, it was just an extremely strong laxative. So yeah, if you're gonna take it, make sure you're close to home. Yeah. Number four, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, old west saloons with the swinging doors and stuff, a few catchphrases and a cowboy with some whiskey, all that good stuff. The bartender back then would pour a drink, the cowboy would take the bottle instead. So illegal, sir, that's that, please put that back. Back in the wild, wild western days, grabbing a drink at the bar wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like anything you see in the movies. It sucked. Bartenders, they had no regulations to follow behind that dirty bar. But not only was it very high proof, but some beverage like tarantula juice was just, it would just poison you. It was literal poison. If its name didn't tip you off, it was literally made with poisonous ingredients. Cause that was, that's how cowboys did it back then. But they're Paris. I don't know. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine. If you drink it, you're gonna feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. 
That was their pitch back then. They're like, eh, happy hour. Come get Drangela juice. I'm like, awesome. Thank you so much. How do I not tip? Which button do I press to not give you money? You freak. Number three, grow it out. In the old West era of the United States, men often grew their hair long as a practical choice rather than a cool fashion statement. You know what I mean? All those bandits with their long hair. They had to. Living in the rugged and often isolated terrain of the West, men had to perform many physically demanding tasks like hunting, ranching, mining, pouring whiskey drinks and tarantula juice. Long hair would help protect their scalp and neck from the sun and wind and all that good stuff. But it's important to note that haircuts were not always easily accessible back then. And many men back then could not afford them or did not have access to a barber. It's like, I can't cut it. It's like, where? We don't have anything. We don't have dental. What do we do? As a result, growing their hair long became a practical and functional choice for many men back in the old west rather than, you know, style. And they were going for looks back then. They weren't doing man buns, doing the cowboy thing. They're like, no, I have bugs. I don't want you to see my bugs. I'm going to grow it. Thanks. Number two, outhouses. This one here stinks. In the wild west, outhouses were sadly common as indoor plumbing was not yet available. Didn't think of that yet. So these structures were often simple and consisted of a small building, if you want to call it that, with a hole in the ground for your Huh, your waste disposal, if you want to call it that. Now, due to the unsanitary conditions and lack of proper waste management and knowledge and, you know, knowledge about germs and stuff, outhouses could attract a variety of insects and other pests, and it was just bad to go in there. Flies, mosquitoes, other bugs, they were commonly found in and around these structures, and they could potentially transmit diseases to humans. So, if you're in there, you really get your business done and then get out. You don't want to waste time. You're not checking any tweets while you're in there, that's for sure. Despite the unsanitary conditions of an outhouse, they were a necessary part of daily life in the Wild West. And people learned to tolerate the bugs and just deal with it because they're like, you know what? This is better than going on outside. Whatever's going on out there, we're good. Close that up. One time I went to a cottage when I was younger and my mom didn't tell me that they had only an outhouse. No running water the entire week. I was like, awesome, let's turn around, I guess. I'm not doing that. I held it for like seven days straight. It's a nightmare. And finally, number one, broken bones. I'm lucky enough to have never broken a bone. I mean, knock on all the woods. But what if you did back in the old Western days, right? Then what would happen? But is a cowboy gonna heal you up? No. What if you were trying to learn a kickflip and you broke your leg? Then what? What are you gonna do? If the dental plan was any indication, it's... It's not pretty, not a lot of options. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence, particularly among those who worked in physically demanding jobs, like ranchers, miners, cowboys, around livestock, those things kicking you randomly, something's gonna break. Treatment options were limited and often relied on first aid techniques, you know, splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available, such as wood, cloth, or even animal hides. It sounds crazy, but back then, that was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. Pain relief, that was only provided with natural remedies, such as oak or willow bark tea, so. You're gonna feel that entire healing process. It's gonna suck. More serious fractures, like ones that, you know, go through the skin, those require the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, you know, those medical professionals back then were not always available in the remote areas of the Wild West. No helicopter's gonna come in and grab you and then take you out. No, it's. You're basically fucked more often than not. Starting with trick number 10, Queen Caroline, the clothed bather. So I'm not gonna lie, like 80% of this list is gonna be bath specific because for some reason, royals got really weird with that. When Caroline arrived in England as Princess of Wales in 1714, she amazed the court with her regular bathing habits. She liked her skin and gowns to be clean and her servants well manicured, a completely unheard of requirement in the time. What can I say? In the 17th century, bathing was controversial. There was two sides to the debate. One that said that bathing was healthy, and the other that argued it could damage your health, except in the most carefully prescribed circumstances. Now, her frequent bathing isn't subject of this section, per se, because we don't perceive that as uncommon today. The commentary is actually going to be how on Caroline would bathe with clothing on. Not like those big old elaborate ball gowns, but in a, like a boxy slip, yeah. Wet but fully clothed, she would have been dunked with warm water, rubbed with flannel cloths, and treated with soap solutions and cosmetic preparations like may do, or the milk of asses and mares, which is a lovely little segue into milk baths. Number nine. You may think I'm about to spew off some Cleopatra facts and stories, which is fair. She and the Empress Papapea did make this treatment famous, but I'm talking about a different monarch and one funky decision she'd make it after the bath. So milk baths use lactic acid, a alpha hydroxy acid to dissolve the proteins which hold together dead skin cells. Whether or not the ancients knew all that, they could tell it had a rejuvenating effect on their skin. Whenever she was suffering from a distressing malady, 
which is olden terms for a woman being upset, Countess Platten Hanover bathed in milk, and then generously donated the contaminated milk to the poor. Lives of Queen of England, The House of Hanover, Volume 1 by Dr. John Dodon documented one such occasion, writing, Whenever Countess Von Platten designed to appear with more ordinary brilliance than her own person, she was accustomed to indulge in an extravagant luxury of a milk bath. And it was added by the satirical or the scandalous that the milk which had just lent softness to her skin was charitably distributed amongst the poor of the district wherein she occasionally affected to play the character of Dorcas from the Bible. Now to answer the age old question, why toilets are called thrones is number 8. So French King Louis was downright gnarly. If he was alive now the dude would probably be one of those people that's part of like that no shoes movement and refuses to wear deodorant and just terrorizes Walmart with how they smell. He famously made Versailles so bad it smells to this day and apparently he only bathed three times in his entire life which should probably be punishable by death because I can't imagine someone who has literally never bathed not smelling offensive. Apparently he changes clothes three times a day and had a new perfume made every week to help but this gross little weasel really went the full mile. He had a toilet seat under his throne and he would use it while addressing the court. Imagine dying of boredom during the king's mandate and all of a sudden he starts making faces and pausing in sentences and clinging to the throne arms trying to force out that day's dinner. Imagine accidentally making eye contact. I think I'm done with this segment now. And talking of unpleasant sights, Isabelline Brown is number 7 on the list. Victorian orsonologists, that's a fancy name for bird science people, are some of the only fun sciencey folks out there. They like to use obscure adjectives when naming newfound species, especially those that are a predominant color. As a result, there are species whose names include such words as Cersaline, which is sky blue, Cenarius, which is ashy, and Citrine, a light olive for some examples. But my favorite avian hue is Isabelline. Why? Because of its off-color origins, that's why. So prepare to ratch. Isabella and her husband, Albert IV, Archduke of Austria, were the sovereign of the Spanish Netherlands from 1598 to 1621. British folklore goes that in 1601, a Spanish army led by Albert laid siege to Austin on behalf of her half-brother, King Philip III of Spain. Isabella apparently was feeling very, very confident in her husband's ability to win, so confident she vowed not to change her underwear until the city was taken. Unfortunately for Isabella and her entourage, her husband was not a great military tactician and the siege lasted until 1604, so three years. And for those three years, Isabella supposedly wore the same grubby underwear until they developed a range of unsavory coloration. Now if you're currently retching, I'm sorry, but I'm not letting up. Isabella, as a color description, was used before the siege in the year 1600, the inventory of Queen Elizabeth I's wardrobe. So if the color Isabella predates the siege of Austin, then the expression must come from an earlier Isabella. The French, German, Italian, and Spanish languages all have versions of the word with a similar folk entomology, except that in all cases, the reference is to the eight-month siege of Granada by Isabella I of Castile and her husband Ferdinand II of Aragon. So if any royal Isabella did give their underoos the world's worst tie-dye job, then well, it seems likely it was Isabella of Castile. So let's talk about Isabella of Castile for number six and her bathing ban, shall we? So Philip II, Isabella's father, banned bathhouses in 1576. So apparently it's in the genetics to be downright filthy. This may sound crazy, but in Spain, the Christian doctrine saw bathing as a corrupt practice that could only lead to nakedness. Apparently being a human in your most natural form was considered hedonism and something unreligious. God forbid if you splash some water on you too. So this belief was to such a wild extent, Christians often walked from England or France to Jerusalem as a ritual without washing or changing their clothes. After the conquest of Granada by the Christians, the Muslims of Spain not only had to give up their religion to survive the Inquisition, but they also had to give up bathing. Isabella and Ferdinand ordered the Muslim baths to be destroyed and informed them that bathing was strictly forbidden. Isabella boasted that she herself, their leader, had only bathed twice in her life and pretty much every historian takes her word for it. Makes sense that she would be so grimy they can name a questionable shade of brown after her underwear. Naturally, the Muslim people are absolutely horrified because cleanliness is literally mandatory in their religion as the prerequisite for every form and mode of worship. And by extension, it had become culturally significant. To separate them from their religion and then ban their last remaining tie to it, that's dirtier than Isabella's briefs. Even when Columbus mentioned the daily bathing habits of the indigenous peoples of Bahamas and the Caribbean, Isabella was horrified to the point of rage and commanded them too as her new subjects to stop this blasphemous bathing practice at once. Yeah, so number five is the highly debated bloodbaths. 
Yes. Oh, you thought Kim Kardashian invented the vampire facial? Girl, please. The culture vulture ain't got nothing on this. So, enter Elizabeth Bathory, who was either genuinely a menacing sociopathic killer or a pawn incriminated by family. If she was the first one, then you could definitely count her fave beauty hack as uncommon. So, Bathory is often proclaimed as the most prolific female killer of all time, accused of more than 600 plus young women's deaths inside her lavish castle. According to legend, she believed bathing in virginal blood would grant her eternal youth. And according to witnesses, if you want to believe a bunch of biased people after her money, Bathory's crimes took place between 1590 and 1610, with the most vicious happening after her husband's death in 1604. And it would take the blood of three maidens to fill Bathory's clawfoot porcelain tub. She would also use the blood as lip tint and rouge, and Bathory's alleged crimes have inspired films, plays, operas, television shows, and even video games. And you may be wondering, what is that exotic scent? Well, it's number four, dead cat musk. Henry VIII had some fun and fabulous hygiene habits. He invented groom of the stool, didn't bathe often, and when he did, it was in an old and aged version of a wooden jacuzzi tub, and he always had someone else wash his undercarriage. Sometimes while taking these baths to ease the pain in his sore leg, Henry soaked a mixture of herbs, musk, and civet. What is civet? Well, the segment's name should probably imply it. It's a dead cat. It's a fancy kind of dead cat to be particular because it's small, wild, and carnivorous with a super distinct smell. I am not sure what cat musk smells like, but if it's anything like the smell of their spray, I am more than okay with not knowing. Like many people of his day, Henry also went to bed in a piece of fur so that fleas and lice would jump on it and not his royal skin. Which begs the question, wouldn't the fleas be confused if you smelled like a dead cat? Banned from drinking it, but love to bathe in it. Number three is Mary Queen of Wine. Get it? Cause she's usually called Mary Queen of Scots and Scots sounds like scotch. Went too far with it. That's okay. Anyways, so apparently Mary Queen of Scots wouldn't bathe in mere water, but in sweet white wine as she believed it to be good for her complexion. She wouldn't touch a drop of the drink being staunchly religious, but she still kept wine stores just to have poured in her bathtub, believing it to make her look pale and beautiful. Also Mary equipped this as a form of pain relief. With vino therapy including wine massages, face and baths remaining popular today, this shouldn't actually come as a surprise, especially because wine baths can be traced back to the times of Greece and Rome. There's even a very famous 16th century recipe called Afar Bella Fascia, which translates to to make a beautiful face. And it has a recipe to create a cosmic brew by boiling rosemary flowers with white wine. Quite a few people have tried it, as you can find the recipe online, and one tester group was called the Beautiful Chemistry Project, which studies its effects on skin quality and discovered that the process released a essential oils and chemicals with antibacterial, moisture binding, collagen growth stimulating, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, brightening and soothing effects. Number two is the stuff of nightmare, it's the permed wig. This really came as a shocker and is quite weird. So when King Charles II had intercourse with ladies, he would collect some of their down their hair and then he would stitch it into a wig, which he donated to a club for rich nobles, I don't know, to like look at it, and then it was stolen from that club where someone starts another club where people came just to kiss the, the wig thing. Anyway, so King George IV was so inspired by this, he started doing the same. But unfortunately, he failed to complete his down there hair wig because he died before he finished collecting enough hair. Yeah, moving on. And last but not least, number one, ohagoro. So the Japanese custom of blackening one's teeth is an ancient practice, whether in the famous Genji Monogatari, a book from the 12th century that is considered the world's very first novel, or in various fairy and folk tales. The art of blackening one's teeth held a prominent place in Japan's history for some time. One of the main reasons for ohagoro is the fact that for hundreds of years, pitch black objects were regarded with immense beauty. It's only natural that people wanna get closer to to what they deem as beautiful, just like the process of having one's teeth bleached to appear more white in modern times. So using a solution called Kenimizu, made out of ferric acetate from iron fillings mixed with vinegar and tannin from vegetables or tea, the custom was first used to celebrate someone's coming of age. Around the end of the Heian period, teeth blackening was done by adult aristocrats and nobles regardless of gender on a daily basis. By the time we hit the Edo period in 1603, teeth blackening is a sign of nobility and aristocracy is exclusively, especially amongst wealthy married women trying to mimic the allure of a geisha. Even now when walking the streets of Kyoto, Japan's old capital, it's not uncommon to meet a mako with 
pitch black teeth. As you might know, during the end of the Edo period and the beginning of the Meiji period, Japan was visited by Western foreigners after almost 200 years of seclusion. Being used to Western beauty standards, many visitors were shocked to see women with black teeth walking around. Some even thought that the Japanese people had terrible mouth hygiene, mistaking the dye for actual tooth rot, and then others, having realized the blackening was on purpose, wondered why Japanese women would disfigure themselves. Okay. So Ohagoro was banned by the Meiji government in 1870 to appeal to Western opinions, and the art of dyeing one's teeth was almost forgotten. Today, it can be seen in theaters, movies, and the aforementioned Kyoto, where Geisha and Maiko still roam the street. Number 10 is a rocky time, because toilet paper didn't migrate its way over to Europe until the 16th century. Before, it was all sponge sticks and rocks, baby, and stones were actually a pretty common bathroom solution for the average Greek, who used rounded pieces alongside ceramics known as pisoi, which translated to pebbles. They kept a pile of these pebbles in their lavatories in some cute little Bed Bath & Beyond brand wicker baskets for whenever it was time to freshen up. And similar to how we have the phrase, toilet paper doesn't grow on trees, they also had the saying to encourage a little frugality in the bathroom. Three stones are enough to wipe. But my favorite fun fact is some of these pisoi sometimes originated as ostraka, the pieces of broken ceramic on which the Greeks of old inscribed the names of enemies. The ostraka were used to vote Big Brother style for some pain in the well, you know what, to be thrown out of town, hence ostracized. Check out the Bumblebee video Top 10 Historical Laws That Defy Logic to learn all about this strange law and phenomena, and maybe subscribe to our Hive while you're at it to stay up to date on all our video releases. This creative recycling of ostraka as pisoi allowed you to quite literally wipe your on the name and representation of someone you hate. However, the downside is that ancient Greek society had immensely high case of hemorrhoids, so you win and you lose. Number nine is red lit pale face, and I'd say she was breathing in snowflakes too, but there wasn't any of that in ancient Greece. At least I don't think so. While nowadays there's a massive culture of skin tanning and darkening, but in olden times, it was the opposite. It was pale, pale, pale. People wanted to look like chalk, loaves of wonder bread. The closer your complexion was to that of HP printer paper, the better. Even if it meant the Greeks would powder their entire bodies with lead to achieve it. Now that was around 200 BC, but thankfully by 1000 BC, they'd wisened up and realized rubbing poison over their entire body maybe wasn't the vibe. So instead, they mixed it with chalk, because you know, diluted poison isn't as bad as the full thing, and then they smeared that everywhere. At least it was less deadly. After achieving the visage of freshly prepared mayonnaise, Grecian gals would then mix up some red iron deposit powder with fat or wax and rub that on her lips. And now, ice that cake with mascara. Don't worry, it's only a mixture of egg whites, resin, and ammonia, you've now achieved the supernatural glam that doesn't make you look like the puppet from Saw at all. Number eight is scrape it off. The ancient Greeks looked at bathing as aesthetic purposes first, actual hygiene second. Bathing wasn't to clean away dirt per se, rather to beautify the body. The Greeks did invent soap down the line, but prior to the advent of public baths in 600 BC, they started off using box of clay, sand, pumice, and ash that they'd rub away with olive oil after applying. The same oil that they'd then scrape off. This was done with a strigil. But that's okay. After 600 BC, you can always have a nice refreshing bath, right? Think again. Contrary to popular perception, not every city or village in ancient world had a public bath, or even if it did, they weren't always open to everyone. Even when they were in fashion, if you were from a lower class, the best you could expect would be scrubbing yourself with old and pure olive oil that multiple people have already applied, scraped off, and returned to the same barrel for all poor people public use jug. If you were extra lucky, there would be a wash bowl, but then you'd be expected to shave it, or even the water with someone else. Speaking of, number seven is sweat sales. So unlike the poor, who scraped oil off into a container and reused it over and over until it eventually became sludge, or the rich, who could use oil once and then just toss it out, athletes of Greece would scrape their oils off into special little containers. It's the same with their actual sweat to be sold. Sweat could easily be collected with a strigil the same as oils, and it would carry the dead skin cells and grime with it. This was called boilog and the servants or athletes themselves would be expected to harvest it for people of Greece to do all sorts of weird things with it. These scrapings would then be sold as medicine, beauty products, perfume, you name it. People would rub the sweat of athletes on their skin, believing it to calm aches and pains, which it probably didn't do particularly well. If nothing else though, the Greek people, after rubbing some sweat and dirt on their skin, got to smell like an Olympian and enjoy some of the youthful vigor of the young men it came off of. At the same time, the gyms themselves would cash in on their youth 
user's bodily fluids and would often scrape their walls and floors for extra goods. Then invite companies to bid on the bottles of sweat. So the next time you're at the gym and you get off that machine and you leave that fresh layer of you do where your back used to be, wipe that crap off before someone harvests it and sells it like a freak. Number six is mystery creams. I only call them that because it's a mystery why they'd ever want to use these products as creams. I want to know who woke up one day and slapped some crocodile crap on their face. How did they figure out that this was a skincare thing? Someone had to be the first. I like to think that person fell in it, woke up the next day looking radiant, but whatever. Yeah, so crocodile dung was a big, big part of Grecian life because so were the animals, but it was far from being a nuisance. They and folks saw this as an opportunity and the croc dung became part of many recipes for effective skincare treatment. This is face masks, contraceptive, hair masks, feet soaks. Hell, one recommendation for treating scars or crow's eyes around the eyes was by applying a little crocodile dung as eyeshadow. To quote a Greek medical document, levigate the dung of the land crocodile with water and anoint. If they have the means and the monies, people might even also have a whole dung bath in order to feel rejuvenated. I feel like that last one might have been a bit much, and considering the story of the ancient Greek philosopher Hercules, I am not far off in that opinion. Afflicted by swollen skin, he decided the best course of action would be some dung therapy. He buried himself in warm dung and mud in order to treat his condition. However, he stayed in the pile too long and ended up overheating and dying. Number five is some hair raising standards. As you can probably guess from looking at the statues and other works of art they left behind, the ancient Greeks weren't a big fan of bodily hair. For them, the ideal body, especially for women, was smooth like a dolphin all over. Naturally, in a time before Gillette razors and Shea Butter Shave Cream, twas not that simple. Since they didn't have modern waxing solutions or even razors, despite making the strigil, which if they had sharpened even a little, could have been made for the perfect razor slash hedge trimmer. So the simplest way of achieving the beauty ideal was to simply pluck out individual hairs one by one. A painful, not to mention time consuming process for your legs alone. Imagine trying to do that around back when mirrors haven't been invented yet. Fancy a swifter solution? Well, how about burning all your body hair off? Also the custom in ancient Greece. Best part of that, a lot like today, is if you don't keep up with the societal expectation of shaving, you'd receive a lot of disapproval and discomfort from others. But unlike today as stated, it was a lot harder for them to shave, so the fact that expectation was there is insane. This is all about the power balance of the sexes, however, as respectable women's ritualistic deletion of her natural state attests to the male supremacy over his objectified wife. While he has his manhood intact, she must deplete her womanhood and thus alter her innate form so as to uphold the classical ideal. Somehow that didn't apply to eyebrows though. No, no, no. Those had to be like full Frida Kalho experience. The Greeks wanted their ladies' eyebrows to look like a push broom on their damn forehead. In case you ain't picking up what I'm putting down, unibrows were all the rage. Even if you couldn't get to grow one, you could always draw some in. Number four is the bush, the favorite of the 70s and of ancient times. Historically, ancient Greek men have had an absolutely fascinating relationship with their down there hair and how they cultivate it. The styles of trimming and manscaping changing per centuries in the overtures of cultural change. In the classic period, the trimming and even shaping, yes, shapes like a heart or a sparkle or a loaf of bread, I don't know, I'm just spitballing, were done on a men's down there. Naturally, this was easiest and most elaborately done by aristocrats, while the poor and common men did more basic triangles or squares or whatever you can do, I don't know. Anyways, by modifying his natural state down there, a man can remove himself from the realm of ordinary man. I mean, think about it. Natural down there growth equalizes every man post P, but the aristocrat elevates himself with this shaven distinction, idealizing its subject as a man more sophisticated than one who possesses unruly and uncontrollable tough. However, during the Tyrannicides revolt, Greek artisans started repping the ah natural in challenge to this. In general, the artistic representation of pubic hair became more naturalistic, abandoning the archaic array of wildly shaven flourishes for simpler and subtler trim jobs. The Greek state began to show that it valued the average citizen with both its institution of democracy and by extension its more naturalized rendering of down there hair. The increasingly liberated down there hair on the mid 5th century masculine sculptures exemplifies this development. The ancient Greeks continued to fluctuate through down there hairstyles afterwards and their paper trail or perhaps hair trail isn't subtle either. Sculptors throughout centuries mark these changes as does scholarly works such as Asterophon's Listatria. Number 3 is teeth cleaners. Got to get your chompers squeaky clean somehow. And back in ancient Greece, you had a few options. First off, powders would be made less toothpaste and these would be substances like lum, ashes, clay, peppermint, propolis, fennel seeds, cardamom seeds, and a magic substance called mast. 
Mastic. Mastic is also a resin that's a strong antiseptic. They also added abrasives like sand and crushed bones. These powders would be applied to a thin, dampened cloth, string, or twigs, all of which would be then used to rub, buff, and shine in between and on the teeth. By the time of the Roman Empire, the elites had actual servants whose job it was to clean others' teeth, and you could visit them and pay for a wash job. Now to address the whole year and mouthwash thing we've all heard about at some point. It's true, but it's not. It's not like the Greeks were gargling the early morning dark yellow. They were adding derived properties from urine to their toothpaste. So that brings us to number two, which is the uses of urine. Similar to how you can harvest salt from water, you can collect important acidic properties from processing urine. This is still awful and gross, but only because in modern times, we're a lot more squeamish to concepts like that. In fact, people back then weren't even unaware that it was kind of crazy. The poet Catalyst once mocked his clean tooth enemy, Agnetius, who, to quote him, has shiny white teeth and grins forever everywhere. If he is in court when the council excites tears, he grins. If he be at a funeral pyre where one mourns a son devoted, where bereft mother's tears stream for her only son, he grins, whatever it may be, wherever he is, whatever may happen, he grins. And he curses him out by saying to him that the higher the polish on your teeth, the more it proclaims that you have drank your piss. The Roman Emperor Vaspian famously instated a urine tax by taxing the public bins where people dumped urine collected from toilets. The tax was so lucrative that it was continued by his successor Titus. The collected pee was then sold as an ingredient to businesses, workshops, and tanneries, which subsequently were taxed for it. These businesses used it for tanning leather, producing soaps, refining tooth products, making medicine, making elixirs, and more. Ammonia, urine's key ingredients, was used by launderers to get stains out of clothes, and even farmers used it as fertilizer to grow the perfectly acidic fruits. Number one is Aunt Flo. It's been determined that there's a good possibility that women back then had fewer periods and lighter bleeding in ancient Greece than we do now in modern times, just because of diet, climate, and biological changes over history. But weirdly, the expectation was that they would actually bleed very heavily and regularly, and if they didn't, then remedies needed to be used to bring out the blood. Aristotle mentions menstruation being like the flow of blood from a sacrificial animal that must be maintained. As for stopping the flow once it started, the ancient Greeks took after the Egyptians, using a small wooden splint as the tampon base, then wrapping wools and linens around it before cramming it on in. Reusable pads were also made of layering cottons and wools that can be easily separated and washed later. Just remember not to wear any white in the hot Mediterranean sun while you're quite literally on the rag. Arsenic makeup. Back in March of this year, Washington joined more than a dozen other states in seeking to crack down on toxic substances and cosmetics. This came about after a state-funded study found that there was arsenic in makeup products by made by CoverGirl. It's incredibly alarming that some companies continue to use arsenic in their products, presumably to lower costs, since we've known about the dangers of the substance since the Victorian era. Most notably when people in Bavaria allegedly took to soaking in arsenic baths to keep their skin pristinely white. While arsenic is not as deadly when used to bathe in as it is when ingested, which can be fatal with less than one eighth of a teaspoon, bathing in water containing the toxic element can cause severe irritation, skin redness, pigmentation changes, and skin lesions. But perhaps even worse, the fumes from the element pose an even bigger threat. According to the EPA, chronic inhalation of arsenic fumes poses a wide range of health risks from pharyngitis to lung cancer. While no one's bathing in it anymore, I hope, arsenic is still seen plenty in the marketplace and CoverGirl is only one example. At number 9 is teeth whitening. Wanting pearly white teeth is not a new concept by any means. In fact, the practice of teeth whitening began around 4,000 years ago with the ancient Egyptians, who created a whitening paste using ground pumice stone mixed with wine vinegar. Since white teeth were always a mark of beauty and a sign of wealth, people throughout history have done a lot to get them, even with the side effects. For example, ancient Romans whitened their teeth using urine since the ammonia acted as a bleaching agent, and in the 17th century, people relied on their barbers for the care of their hair and teeth. And I almost never like a haircut, so that tells me what the quality of dental treatment people were getting. Barbers would file down the teeth and apply hydrogen peroxide to whiten them, and while the practice did make teeth whiter, it eroded tooth enamel and led to decay. Teeth whitening is still not foolproof today, however better than whatever barbers were doing, I hope. These days, teeth whitening kits are pulled from shelves pretty frequently due to intensely high levels of hydrogen peroxide, which cause gum burns and tooth loss. In 2021, an investigation was launched on Oral Orthodontic Materials Store, a company on AliExpress, was found to have products containing illegal levels of the substance at 30.7%. 
the usual amount used for teeth whitening being only 5%. These were quickly pulled from shelves, but anyone buying teeth whitening products from AliExpress should be well aware of what they're getting themselves into. At number 8 is waist training with corsets. Corsets are one of the most notorious beauty accessories for causing obvious pain. They have been around for centuries to create the desired dramatic hourglass figure that for some reason became the ideal, despite it not being a natural asset for any human on earth. An anthropologist, Rebecca Gibson, conducted a study of 10 female skeletal remains from the Victorian and Georgian eras, and she found the rib cages and spines of the corset wearing women were deformed, thus pushing the diaphragm and major organs up and out of their original positions. Women weren't the only ones wearing corsets during the 19th century. Men, like England's King George IV, often strapped himself into the garment and as well did not go without suffering the consequences that came with it. In 1821, the severe constriction of his body from the corset caused George to nearly faint, which isn't a symptom that's gone away in the modern age. It's surprising that the corset trend hasn't gone away entirely considering the risks and possible danger, and instead has had quite the renaissance with current Gen Z fashion and television period pieces. But with the information we have that's widely available about how corsets may cause a wide range of complications like pneumonia, constipation, raised blood pressure, acid reflux, and fainting, rumors have begun to circulate that Netflix and BBC are phasing out the use of corsets from movies and TV shows. Although they've been a longtime fixture in TV show wardrobe and shows such as Bridgerton, Downton Abbey, and Jane Eyre, The Sun newspaper reports that TV producers are becoming increasingly concerned about the health effects on actresses wearing them for up to 14 hours a day on set, which oftentimes cause bruising, breathing troubles, and pain. It's said that Bridgerton producers have told the cast of the Netflix show that they don't have to use them, and many other production companies are set to follow suit, especially after the SAG after strike put restrictive costuming compensation as one of their clauses. At number 7 is decorative contact lenses. While they absolutely didn't have contact lenses in the Victorian era, they used what they had at their disposal to make their eyes appear brighter. Many Victorian ladies took to squirting lemon juice in their eyes, which makes me shiver just thinking about it. If you got lemon juice in your eyes these days, you probably wouldn't consider that a cosmetic revelation, but instead an absolute disaster. I'm not sure if it would even make your eyes look any better, because it usually just causes redness and irritation to put citrus anywhere near your eyes. Queen Victoria herself also turned to putting undesirable stuff in her eyes, but even worse than lemon juice, she opted for belladonna, you know, the well-known poison. It was said to have dilated her pupils so she could see, and it wasn't like cataract surgery existed yet, so use what you got. This made dilated pupils a desired look though, so belladonna became extremely popular for getting that job done. Although belladonna is usually fatal if ingested, it is fortunately rarely deadly when used as an eye drop. However, long-term use of the poison can result in a lethal overdose. Immediate side effects include irritation, blurred vision, and light sensitivity, and sometimes dizziness, fainting, and irregular heartbeats. Making your eyes appear different is still huge in the market today, but with our new technology and eye contacts, you can put almost anything in that ocular cavity, even if you shouldn't. In 2002, the US Food and Drug Administration issued a health warning about the dangers of non-prescription decorative eye contact lenses because of the dozens of reports that said such contacts caused corneal ulcers, blindness, conjunctivitis, and ocular infections. Even if it is super cool to have a different eye color, it may not be worth the trouble. At number 6 is face powders with dangerous chemicals. Similar to our 10th point on this list, there have been a multitude of banned products over the past years containing toxic chemicals. Except this isn't to lighten skin, but instead cover blemishes. In the Victorian era, many women turned to face powders containing quite mild ingredients like rice powder, zinc oxide, and the extremely expensive blend of chloride of bismuth and talc, but others made use of lead, which nowadays we understand to not only be extremely toxic, but absorbed through the skin at alarming rates. Side effects of lead poisoning include headache, constipation, memory loss, pain, and numbness, and if ingested in large quantities, will cause paralysis and death. Finding toxic chemicals and makeup products is hardly a thing of the past, as mentioned multiple times with this list. In 2019, Makeup at Claire's, a children's fashion accessory retail chain found in most malls, issued a voluntary recall twice in a three-month period over concerns of asbestos contamination in its makeup products. A batch of the Jojo Siwa makeup set tested positive for asbestos during the FDA's ongoing investigation of asbestos contamination and cosmetics. Exposure to asbestos dust can cause serious health conditions decades later 
cancer, including lung cancer and mesothelioma. Coming in at our halfway point is acne supplements. Arsenic wasn't used just to lighten skin, but also as a way to clear skin back in the day. Man, what a fix-all product. Not, nah, it has literally always been a poison. Women consumed arsenic through the form of wafers and believed eating these deadly supplements not only cleared their complexions, but also changed the shape of their faces by softening sharp features and disfigurements. In 1902, the Sears catalog coined Dr. Rose's French arsenic complexion wafers, saying it possessed, quote, the wizard's touch in producing, preserving, and enhancing beauty of the face while it developed a transparency and clearness of complexion, shapely contour of form, brilliant eyes, soft and smooth skin. What an understandable and well-written tagline. The advertisement adamantly claimed that the amount of arsenic in these wafers was crafted by expert chemists and thus was completely safe to eat, which is obviously untrue. But hey, we also thought cigarettes were healthy. The doughy complexion wasn't a result of their improved skin, but the red blood cells that the arsenic was destroying just below the skin's surface. According to Andrew Meharg, an arsenic expert and professor of biogeochemistry at the University of Aberdeen, found that regular exposure to even minute amounts of inorganic arsenic increases a person's risk of heart disease and cancer. On top of the long list of horrific side effects, which includes renal failure, epilepsy, and numbness, and at higher doses, arsenic even caused the skin deformities that these wafers claimed to remedy. At number four is mercury eyeshadow. Now, putting some shiny powder on your eyelids is hardly a behavior of the 20th century. In fact, traces of eyeshadow were first detected on Egyptian makeup brushes, oftentimes made from lead, ash, and oxidized copper. Our inclination to use dangerous substances on our faces only got worse as time went on, as in the Victorian era, a substance called cinnabar was used to create a vermilion red color that was oh so desirable. Although adding some rouge to your face may make you appear livelier, cinnabar contains mercuric sulfide, which is known to cause kidney damage. Mercury has been found in cosmetics today, even after being banned from use in cosmetics in 1972 by the FDA. A new report from the Zero Mercury Working Group finds that almost half of skin lightening creams tested contain dangerously high levels of mercury, but continue to be sold by online retailers like Amazon, even after multiple studies have linked mercury to a multitude of serious health problems, such as damage to your central nervous system, lung damage, and can often be fatal. Our number three spot goes to radioactive toothpaste. During the 1920s, doormat radioactive toothpaste hit the shelves. They literally said it's radioactive on the tube. Can't do much more warning than that. The toothpaste was slightly radioactive because it contained small amounts of ionizing radiation, which claimed to have health benefits like antibacterial properties and strengthening the defenses of teeth and gums by, quote, charging cells with a new vigorous life energy. These claims were bogus and, in fact, caused damaging effects to anyone who used the paste for a prolonged period of time. In the 20s, the harmful effects of radiation were not fully understood and instead were often promoted as a cure for all types of illnesses, which led to many radiation-based medicines and therapies such as radon-infused drinking water, which caused a man's jaw to fall off. Radioactivity is now well understood and many of these ill-advised products have disappeared, but not entirely. According to a report by the BBC published in 2021, Dutch authorities have found a number of, quote, anti-5G protection necklaces that give off harmful ionizing radiation. These necklaces are ironically popular amongst anti-5G activists who wear them to fight the harmful radiation of 5G mobile services. Our runner-up is whitening lotions. As said many times on this list, Victorian beauty ideals were unsurprisingly obsessed with incredibly pale skin. Upper-class white women desired a ghostly appearance to signify that their privilege never left them working in the sun. In order to do so, many Victorian women turned to corrosive face lotions, which many times contained lead acetate, known for side effects like paralysis, muscle atrophy, headaches, and nausea, though were advertised as harmless until 1869, when the American Medical Association published a warning. Mercury and lead is still found in skin lightening products today, even though they're both known as a carcinogen that can cause severe skin issues with prolonged use. Health Canada says the sale of such products is illegal, but are still available for purchase with sale clerks just issuing a warning warning of discretion. Not only are whitening creams awful for you physically, but also feed into the racism so blatant in today's society. These lotions are seriously doing nothing but cause harm. Our number one spot goes to hair removal. Back in the day, women sought smooth skin through the use of potassium nitrate. Nowadays, the chemical is used in rocket fuel, fireworks, and fertilizer, but a 1776 hair removal recipe called for potassium nitrate as one of the main ingredients. While it might remove hair, it'll probably also remove a layer of skin and cause lung damage with the poisonous gases it emits. 
Today, hair removal cream still has the potential to do more harm than good, with the most popular on the market in air, oftentimes causing chemical burns, blisters, and rashes. 